doing this for more years than I like to remember, but it's a task that I enjoy thoroughly. Uh, I'd like to tell everybody to open up their appointment books because we have a treat. Our next luncheon is December the 6th, a Tuesday, and our speaker is going to be Professor John Q. Barrett, who is uh, the chair of the Legal Services, uh, the Legal History Committee. He's a professor at St. John's and an expert on the Nuremberg trials. I'm not sure what his subject is, but I've heard him speak, and I, I encourage everybody to put it into their book. Uh, I'd like to do a few thank yous here. First, I'd like to thank Doris Keeley. What happened to you, Doris? Where are you hiding out? Oh, there she is walking around. Well, Doris is our secretary, and she also is the monitor and tells me I'm not allowed to tell war stories, so I, I have to just keep to the facts. Uh, also, of course, uh, for many years, Emily Campbell has been the chair, vice chair of the luncheon committee, and she is devoted in seeing that the flyers go out and we get our uh, correspondence in at uh, the right time and our flyers out. And of course, I. I have to thank uh, my predecessor as the chair of senior lawyers, Jim Harbison, and we found out we had a lot of lawyers that we knew in common, and again, Jim, thanks for your efforts, and I'll do my best to succeed you. Um, the, I'd like to also ask everyone to uh, consider joining the Senior Lawyers Committee. We meet once a month. There's no age limit. You could be uh, of any age, providing you're a member of the bar. So, and let me give you some of the advantages. We have an open bar. <laughs> we also have a terrific cheese selection. And I'm not allowed to tell any war stories, so you can be assured we'll stick to, the, to, to it. And maybe Doris will reconsider. She's hurt my feelings. Uh, so please consider uh, joining the committee. We have openings. And as we meet once a month. Now, I have an asterisk here. So I did mention about John Barrett, who's going to be here. Uh, again, I repeat, that's for the sixth. Now, I'd like to tell you about my uh, one experience in, in all the years that I've asked folks to be a speaker, I have never encountered anyone with the following uh, situation. I read this book that I thought was pretty interesting, and I saw that the author in the flyleaf lived in Brooklyn. And as an ex-Brooklynite myself, I thought we had something in common. So I spent my hard-earned money finding out his telephone number and getting Verizon to call him he called me and I asked him if he would like to be a speaker. And the first thing he said to me, and I, I don't know if I repeated this, is that, what's the honorarium? And I, you know, I think I told this already today. But anyway, I said, uh, the honorarium is an open bar and all you can eat. I'm, I said that before. But anyway, I'd like Emily to introduce our distinguished guest. Thank you very, very much. So good afternoon, everyone. We have a great crowd. Thank you so much for coming. I think this is about uh, as good a turnout as we've ever had. I think uh, Elliot Spitzer may have been an equal uh, number of people, and we know that, uh, that this is a, a really important topic that we're going to have today, and um, appreciate everybody coming. I want to recognize some of our guests today. We have uh, Justice, Justice Beatrice Jane Swit. We have, yes, where, I don't know where she is. Um, 
Oh, yes, back there. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, and we have uh, Aaron Dugan, from uh, the communications director from the, uh, from the district attorney's office. And we have several other people from the district attorney's office today here. Uh, we have Mark Weber from the Appeals Bureau and Yamika Stevenson from the ECAB uh, Complaint Bureau. She is a paralegal there and a law student at Brooklyn Law School getting a jo joint MBA uh, at Baruch. So we want to encourage her to continue her studies. Thank you for coming. Are we missing, have I missed anyone else here from the DA's office? Anyone else? I know we have several alums from the DA's office and we thank you for coming as well. It gives me great pleasure today to introduce Cyrus Vance, Jr. Uh, Mr. Vance is a graduate of Yale University and the Georgetown University Law Center. He began his legal career in the Manhattan DA's office during the high crime era of the 1980s. As an assistant ADA, Mr. Vance handled cases involving murder, organized crime, public corrup corruption, and white collar crime. After leaving the DA's office, Mr. Vance relocated to Seattle, Washington, where he co-founded a law firm there, which became one of the preeminent litigation firms in the Northwest. During his time in Seattle, Mr. Vance taught trial advocacy as an adjunct professor at Seattle University School of Law. In 2004, Mr. Vance returned to New York and became a partner at Morvilla Abramowitz. In, on January 1st, 2010, he became District Attorney of New York County. He is a recognized leader in criminal justice reform and, a proposed, and has a proposed a compelling vision for moving the Manhattan DA's office forward with a focus on crime prevention. He served as a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers. He was an appointee of the Governor of New York as a member of the New York State Appellate Division First Department Judicial Screening Panel, and was a member of the New York State Commission on Sentencing Reform. He previously served as a member of the Justice Council of the New York City Bar Association, the Federal Bar Association, and the New York Council of Defense Lawyers. He was a member of the Boards of Directors of the Fund for Modern Courts, the Sergeant Shriver National Center on Poverty Law, and the Alzheimer's Drug Reco Discovery Foundation. In July 2011, Mr. Vance was voted president-elect of the District Attorneys Association of the State of New York. Today, he serves as co-chair of the New York State Permanent Commission on Sentencing. Today, he's going to be speaking about current issues in the DA's office, and there are so many. As you know, people are going to be marching on his office from the, from the Occupy Wall Street group today, and so we are so grateful that he was still able to come and present today. So please join me in welcoming Cyrus Vance, Jr. <laughs> Thank you very much, Emily. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And given the Emily's announcement, I plan on spending all day in the early <laughs> evening with you. Uh, but I'm thrilled to be here. And on a personal level, I'm thrilled because this organization, the City Bar, has had not only an impact on me as a young lawyer uh, growing up uh, in the profession in New York, but certainly was an organization that my father uh, who was associated with this organization for so many years meant so much to his life. The connection between this organization and our family means a lot to our family. Uh, we work, uh, in fact, with uh, uh, there's a, a group within the within the bar association that deals uh, with pro bono initiatives around around the uh, the world. That's called the Vance Center, uh, named after my father, and that is bringing. Uh, uh, the pro bono philosophy to other countries that don't embrace or don't have the opportunity to have it at the same depth that we have here in New York City. So I thank the bar for inviting me. I thank everybody here for taking time out of uh, your day to come and visit with me. Uh, I thank the committee for uh, inviting me to address this group. And I thank all my friends, many of whom I see here today, uh, not only former colleagues in the law, but uh, Commissioner Rose Gil Hearn and Condon, with whom I work in law enforcement on a day-to-day -day basis, and thank them for all they do. Uh, so everybody, uh, welcome. And I would like to spend uh, the next few minutes talking about uh, what I think is an incredible point in the history of an incredible office, the Manhattan DA's office. Uh, it is an office uh, unlike any other prosecutor's office in the world. And quite honestly, that's why I ran for the job. If you would ask me, as a young lawyer, uh, what would be the job that you would think would be the best legal job in the world as an assistant DA, I would have told you it's the Manhattan DA. And this is why the office is so special. And perhaps some of you may not know these facts, but I'd like to explain them to you. 
Uh, we handle about 110,000 cases a year, somewhere between 100 and 110,000 cases a year. Uh, that is a huge volume of cases, obviously, and those cases range from uh, the least serious to the most serious, from cybercrime to homicide to international bank fraud. There is no prosecutor's office that handles the volume, the breadth, and variety of cases that we do. And that is what makes it so unusual. Just a point of comparison, I think last year with 100,000 cases, we actually had more criminal cases, that is, recognizing that not all of them were complex cases, than the entire, entire Department of Justice nationwide. So this is an office that handles big volume and requires good judgment, good experience, uh, and uh, good thinking by the 500 assistant assistant attorneys whom I'm privileged to work with every day. And I thank those that are here with me today from our office and thank you for the work, uh, for the work that you do. What I'd like to do is to talk about the Manhattan DA's office, where we are at this point in time, what our focus is, and uh, where I see us going. Uh, and I'd like to divide my uh, my, my observations really into a couple of parts. Uh, first, I want to talk about uh, the primary job of the Manhattan DA's office and how that, that has shifted uh, over the last uh, decade or so and how we are approaching it today. Uh, so let me start with philosophy, uh, the philosophy that drove me to run for this office and that drives, I think, the work of every assistant in the office and that I think is the fundamental philosophy that has to be shared by any prosecutor in any office around the country. I think we are driven by two missions, two questions we have to ask ourselves in every initiative and in the handling of every case that comes before us. Is our decision on this matter enhancing public safety in our streets, in our homes, in our businesses, and is it enhancing fairness in the justice system? So put differently, does it make us safer? And does it make the justice system fairer? And those are, I think, the driving questions we ask ourselves in the mission of the Manhattan DA's office. At the time that I took over the DA's office in 2010, uh, it was a remarkable period of change in law enforcement. We had, in New York City, and continue to enjoy New York City, for a number of reasons that I, I'm sure we'll talk about uh, during either my remarks or in questions thereafter, uh, we are the safest big city in America. And so when you take over the Manhattan District Attorney's Office at a point in time when you are living in the safest big city in America, the question is, what should your, you know, what, what do you do as DA in order to continue to advance the mission of enhancing public safety and enhancing fairness? And it was not just enough to sit on our hands and necessarily do business totally as usual and wait for crime to uptick. I think the challenge for me coming in as Manhattan District Attorney and for the office is to continue to be a leader in best practices in law enforcement, which we hold out ourselves out to be to the country. And that means to be a leader in initiatives uh, that enhance fairness and enhance public safety throughout our county. Uh, and I divide this decision, this analysis, into two points. First of all, I look at how we could enhance the work of the office and how I believe we do enhance of the work of the office in terms of more traditional crimes, the crimes that you really focus on intuitively as a DA, uh, the crimes involving youth violence, guns, gangs, and drugs, what happens on our streets. And this isn't an abstract issue. Uh, you know, we read about this in the paper, uh, and everybody I know in this room uh, understands how serious the issue of youth violence is, how serious the issue of guns in the hands of young men and women is. This is something that affects all of us as New Yorkers, and it is, in fact, you know, the primary issue that I uh, sought to try to address uh, in, in a productive way when I became the Manhattan District Attorney. Um, and it's not abstract for me. Uh, yesterday, I was driving in northern Manhattan by the Taft Houses with members of my staff uh, to look at areas where we had operations, prosecution operations in northern Manhattan. And on the way up past 106th Street, uh, someone was shot a block ahead of my car. Uh, about a month, two months ago, I was uh, in East Harlem at church services on Sunday morning. Uh, and as I drove up to uh, the church, uh, I had to cross crime tape uh, to get into the sanctuary to attend church services because of a shooting that had heard happen earlier that Sunday morning. And the month before that, I was at a community meeting in Tayeno Towers in East Harlem. 
And at the meeting with me were community leaders and representatives like Chairman Rang former Chairman Rangel. Uh, and 15 minutes after we left and all the community uh, left and, and exited after our, you know, after our discussion, uh, two people were shot outside, uh, outside of, uh, you know, within a block of where the meeting had been held. So these are issues I not only read about, but that I see and our office sees on a daily basis and is among our highest priorities. What do we do as a Manhattan DA's office that can make us more effective in dealing with youth violence, guns, gangs, and drugs in our community? Historically, uh, prosecutors' offices tend to be reactive. Uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and in fact, I think it was largely driven in the 1980s and 90s by the overwhelming volume of arrests uh, that were occurring when crime was so high in the New York metropolitan area. But when crime is at a lower level, it's an opportunity for a prosecutor's office to rethink how you focus on developing strategies that will, we hope, have an impact on driving down violent activities in our communities. And here's how we've approached it. We always handle, as part of our responsibility, the job of receiving cases that come in from police arrests from the street. That will always be a primary function of our office and one that we won't shy away from. But there was also an opportunity uh, taking over the office to, uh, to approach street crime as a more, in a more proactive enforcement capacity. And so what we did, and what we are doing in the Manhattan DA's office, is we've opened up a unit within the DA's office called the Crime Strategies Unit. The Crime Strategies Unit sits apart from the trial division assistants in our office. There are six lawyers, very senior lawyers. Each of them is assigned to a grouping of precincts in Manhattan. And, with, and, and the groupings of precincts that they are responsible for, uh, they manage with an intelligence analyst, uh, with a law enforcement representative, and with representatives of our Community Affairs Department. So their job in the Crime Strategies Unit is looking at groups of precincts to understand and report to me, block by block, often building by building, who are the individuals who are causing the disproportionate amount of violence in any given neighborhood, and what are the locations where that violence occurs. And what we do then is we share the intelligence that comes from within our office with the intelligence that comes from the police department, and particularly the field intelligence officers in the precincts, and we make sure that we have a strategy identifying who are those individuals that we believe are driving crime and violence in those groupings of precincts, and that we have a strategy, an enforcement strategy, on how to identify them and build cases against them. Now, sometimes, when you're focusing on repeat offenders, what you may do is not have an opportunity to catch that repeat offender on a serious violent offense. But what we find, and I think common sense tells you, is that individuals who repeatedly commit offenses, even serious ones, are often tripped up and caught on more minor offenses. So let me give you an example uh, that came to me from uh, uh, PSA 6, where I was uh, earlier this uh, last week with Jeff Gray, who's in the audience. Uh, we were up at PSA 6, which is, you know, the housing development area, um, and I was talking with the captain there, and he talked about this story about how the Crime Strategies Unit works. Well, there was a rash of burglaries in northern Manhattan. And we had a list of individuals who we believed were causing, I mean, an informal list of individuals, an idea from talking with the precincts about who was causing burglaries in northern Manhattan. And one of the individuals uh, was arrested, I think it was a Saturday night, uh, and immediately we have a system where if an individual is arrested that we're focused on, one of our assistants in the office gets an alert in the middle of the night so that we are right away keyed into the fact that someone that we are focused on has been arrested in Manhattan. Now, as it happened on this instance, it was a minor offense. It happened to be charge, uh, charge of possession of burglar's tools. They were misdemeanor offenses. But because of the way we approach these issues now, we were able to immediately provide information to the assistant downtown Manhattan who was writing the case up to make sure that the case was described in the background of the individual involved as thoroughly as possible to the judge sitting in arraignments. So when the case came through arraignments, the judge understood that this was an individual that was actually, although charged with a relatively minor crime, someone that needed specific focus and uh, where the facts justified actually a bail application uh, to keep this individual in jail. Now in the intervening few days following the individual being kept in jail because of the information we were able to provide to the judge, 
we then, through DNA, link this individual up with a number of other burglaries in the neighborhood. And so this strategy, identifying who the offenders are that are causing a disproportionate amount of crime, focusing on them, sharing that information between our office and the police, enables us to, we believe, make sure that those folks who are causing the most crime are treated the most severely, which I think is appropriate, and that we devote the resources and energy to make the most significant cases we can against them. And time after time, we see in the last year and a half, this is being paid off. And let me give you another example, which is something slightly, maybe a little bit more humorous. There was a gentleman uh, who operated in midtown Manhattan preying on tourists. And I can't remember his name. Uh, but for years, he had 40, 50 arrests. And he'd never served more than convictions, and he never served more than a minimal amount of time on any of these misdemeanor arrests. And his specialty was what's, is what's called fraudulent accosting. And that, what he would do is he would go down the street, he would pick out Bob Fink, he would bang into Bob Fink, he would drop his own glasses, and then he would accost Bob Fink and saying, you broke my glasses, now pay me $200. Now, uh, of course, many people are scared witless. Big guy forcibly standing over these uh, innocent uh, people in the midtown Manhattan, and he got money year after year, day after day. He was probably a very wealthy man. Uh, he ended up among our list of offenders that we were going to focus on. And when he was arrested about a year ago, uh, because we were able immediately to focus the assistance attention in the complaint room that this was an individual who had this particular history, uh, we were able to present this information not only to the assistant DA from our crime strategies unit, but to the judge in arraignment. This individual was indicted instead of fraudulent accosting, which is a misdemeanor, for robbery under the theory, and I think the correct legal theory, that what he was doing was stealing money by use of force, by intimidation, by bumping into Bob and scaring Bob and forcing Bob to part with money from his wallet. This gentleman, who had never served more than six months in jail, ended up going to trial, his right of course, uh, and ultimately, having been convicted after trial, was sentenced to a state prison sentence. So another example of focusing on the individuals through identifying who are the people who cause the most, dis the most violence and the most crime in each neighborhood and having strategies to affect enforcement against them. The second thing that we do is we focus on places. And that was the reason for uh, you know, for my uh, being uptown yesterday was to make sure that I had a better visual understanding of, uh, of the dynamics that go along with, uh, you know, violence in, in particular communities in Manhattan. Um, we have a number of uh, areas in Manhattan where we have identified as uh, areas where uh, an inordinate amount of gun activity and gang activity and violence occurs. I assign teams of assistant DAs to each one of those locations. Their job is to present strategies to me as to how they are going to identify and dismantle the organization that is behind the violence in that community and in that location. Again, it's a proactive, forward-leaning strategy trying to affect crime reduction by focusing on the repeat offenders. Now, the fair question to me is, well, is it working? You know, good idea, but is it working? And I think the fair answer is, it's really too early to tell. But I can tell you this, when I compare the shooting incidents and shooting victims in Manhattan, 2010 over 2011, summer to summer, we are many, 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 many percentage points greater in reduction in shooting incidents and shooting victims than other boroughs in the city. Now, I can't claim, and we wouldn't presume to claim, claim credit for big crime reduction, because once you do that, you own crime increases. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but what I can say is that I think you need, as a DA, at a point in time, uh, as we are now, a strategy, a proactive strategy that uses all the resources and powers of your office, and we have huge authority and resources. I mean, you, we just don't rely on the police department for intelligence. We have 100,000 cases that come through our office each year. Those cases end up yielding informants, cooperators, witnesses, and the trick is to pool that information that you gather from this multitude of cases from your office so that they just, that information just doesn't end on 10,000 legal pads scattered throughout a 500-person law office, but that we're able to gather that information 
digest it in a way that we can then distribute it both to others in our office to help them in enforcement of other cases that come in our office. So it's what we call intelligence-driven prosecution. And it is one of the focuses of our office, and I think it is working, I think it is working well. Uh, there, and and let, me, let me just uh, change, and I'm sure we'll come back to it, um, uh, come back to the subject later. Let me assure you, though, that when you're dealing with youth issues and gang issues and violence issues, that I appreciate, I appreciate probably as much as other county prosecutors, and perhaps even more than some federal prosecutors, uh, the dynamics uh, and, uh, and responsibilities of, of dealing with public safety in our, in our various communities. Because I, you know, I am elected by the communities. I am out in those communities. I deal with church leaders. I deal with community representatives on a daily basis. That's part of my job. And so I am mindful that enforcement is just half the equation. Prevention is equally important as enforcement. And why is prevention important? It's common sense. If you're able to, wouldn't you prefer to have a robbery prevented than a robbery occurred with a successful prosecution? Of course you would. Uh, of course you would. That makes us safer. Uh, and so my focus is on what strategies do we have in the DA's office that can help drive crime even lower by using prevention methods. And we are using many today. Let me start on the back end. Uh, about a month and a half ago, I was out at Queensboro Correctional Facility. Queensboro Correctional Facility is where inmates, some inmates who've been in state prison, come back from state prison before they come back into Manhattan and other, and other counties. And I meet, and our staff meets with those ex-offenders before they come back into the community. Now, why do we bother doing that? First of all, if we do not as an office, as a prosecutor's office, actively engage the community of men and women coming out of prison back into, our, back into our communities, if we do not assist in trying to provide a helping hand uh, for those individuals to succeed when they get back to their communities, we will surely increase the likelihood that they're going to be back in our courtrooms, uh, having committed other offenses in our neighborhoods. So dealing effectively with ex-offenders is part of a crime prevention strategy that I embrace and that our offices embraces. And that, 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 that runs the gamut of uh, trying to provide intelligent assistance in housing, in drug rehabilitation, in employment. Uh, and I think we have an opportunity as a prosecutor's office to play a role uh, to aid this difficult uh, population uh, of, of, of ex-offenders to help them be more successful. Now, I know the city bar has played a big role in this, and we are just one of many players and I certainly don't claim unique awareness of this issue or responsibility for any success. But I think everybody in this room understands that if we don't do a better job with ex-offenders, we're going to have bigger problems in our courtrooms going forward. So we talk about enforcement, but we also talk very aggressively in our office about prevention. And on the front end, we are now partnering with the Police Athletic League, with the NYPD, uh, in a number of youth initiatives in northern Manhattan, first of all focusing on truants, so that when police detain young men and women as truants, we are working with the city and the police for that two or three hours where they're at the, uh, at the uh, Harlem Center of the PAL on 119th Street, we are flooding them with city services and intervention uh, so that the kids and their families, uh, we hope, can have an opportunity to break the cycle of truancy. Why does that matter? Well, it's a public safety initiative. It's a per crime prevention initiative because probably 70% of those kids who are truant on a regular basis are going to be in our courts as offenders. So we have an opportunity as a DA's office and I believe a responsibility to engage in these type of crime prevention strategies on the front end as well as the back end to reduce violent crime in our neighborhoods. And if you want to be up uh, in Harlem on Saturday night, uh, we have a basketball program uh, which we initiated three months ago uh, three weeks ago, excuse me, and we've got about 50 to 113 to 15 year olds uh, working with the police department where we are bringing basketball, uh, you know, a basketball four hour camp uh, to kids in northern Manhattan. So, why is the DA's office doing this? I mean, why is that my job? Well, first of all, we have manpower of people interested in putting this together. And secondly, if you can keep 100 kids, 13 to 15 year old, uh, off the streets between 5 and 9 on a Saturday night, 
that's providing them with direction, modeling, it's providing them with the resources that I think and we think is going to make a difference to keep them out of trouble. So across the board, what the Manhattan DA's office is focusing on aggressive prosecution of those people who are driving violence as well as aggressive programming and intervention in order to achieve what we believe are effective crime prevention strategies. Crime prevention strategies don't just focus on the youth, however. Uh, this past year, we opened up a mental health court in Manhattan. And the reason we opened up a mental health court in Manhattan is because I saw, just like you see, that a huge amount of people who come through our criminal justice system are suffering from various forms of mental illness, whether it is paranoid delusional, whether it is psychotic, or whether it is simply mentally impaired. And what we see in the criminal justice system is people cycled in and out of our courthouses again and again for crimes that they surely may have committed, but where they didn't get the help when they were in the criminal justice system to deal with the underlying mental condition that brought them there in the first place. So this past year, Judge Mershon in Supreme Court uh, is now receiving cases that we refer to the judge, defense lawyers refer cases to the judge, nonviolent felony offenders, who, using a variety of carrot and stick approaches that the judge has, uh, are trying to have individuals who have identified and uh, uh, diagnosed mental illness conditions go through, a court, go through a court process where they can achieve more lenient outcomes if they succeed and at the same time deal with the underlying mental condition that got them there. So, point number one, how we're focusing on aggressive enforcement for public safety issues and crime prevention. Uh, but we don't have success in all that we're doing, and this is where I think, in answer to your question, what is the Manhattan DA's office doing and where do we need to go, we have far more work to do. And let me just focus on domestic violence. Domestic violence and other crimes against particularly vulnerable victims, this is, this is a national health crisis. And it's, a Nash, and it's a city health crisis here, too. Uh, we had about 5,000 cases come through our court system last year, domestic violence. Crime in New York City has decreased. Incidents and complaints involving domestic violence has not. That, that, that has de increased as opposed to decreased. So this has to be a real focus of our office. And I got to tell you, uh, I think, again, everyone in this room understands how significant this issue is. Uh, in the last year, in our office, I know we have had multiple tragic incidents where young women in particular were murdered uh, at the end of a violent relationship with a domestic partner. One in the Lower East Side, which is currently under indictment, uh, which was a, you know, was a, which involved a, you know, a tragic, uh, uh, homicide with a knife, uh, another shooting uh, in Chelsea uh, involving obviously a gun. Uh, you all read about the case uh, which occurred in Brooklyn, perhaps, I think it was last summer, where an individual with a number of domestic incidents reports uh, came, uh, the police responded, and ultimately a police officer died uh, when, when responding to aid the young woman who was, who, you know, who called in, who called in the uh, report. So this is a very, very significant problem for the community, for the city, and for our office. Number of things that we're doing on domestic violence. Uh, first of them, first of all, operationally within the office, uh, we have restructured our special, we've created a special victims bureau, uh, which is now, I believe, providing enhanced training and oversight of all our domestic violence cases. We still have a long way to go. Uh, let me just be candid. We, we are not winning this war yet, uh, but I believe that by uh, making sure as an office we are tracking these cases almost on an individual basis to look at the outcomes and to understand where the case went right or the case went wrong in the court system, it's going to enable us to get better outcomes going forward. I can say that we are more aggressive in terms of indictments. I think our indictments in the domestic violence area are up 30 percent year over year, and I think that's appropriate. Um, but Indictments alone don't, you know, don't give you success. It is ultimately uh, dealing with the overall uh, issue in the community and issues about how to support the victims. So there's two things that we're doing in that area. First and foremost, we're, I believe, going to have a family justice center in Manhattan. 
in 2012. Uh, what is a family justice center? Uh, if you're from Brooklyn, Queens, or the Bronx, you don't have to ask that question because you have one. Uh, but if you're from Manhattan, uh, we don't have a family justice center. And there's no reason why we don't. But what it is, is it is a location where victims of domestic violence in one place can go and get help not only from the police, a prosecutor, but also be tied immediately to city support services through the city agencies. It is a holistic approach to dealing with the issues that confront victims of domestic violence. Victims that frequently are so disappointed by the way the criminal justice tr system treats them, shuttling them from bureaucracy to bureau, uh, that they often lose heart and don't stay with the process and, and, and become unwilling to proceed with the case. So a family justice center in Manhattan, I think has the capacity to, as it has, uh, as it has I believe, succeeded in other bureaus, provide much greater support and service to victims of domestic violence. We also, and I also, spent a lot of time focusing on legislative changes that can protect victims of domestic violence. And specifically, last year, we almost passed and did not, unfortunately, but I believe this year we have a good chance of passing a statute that will enhance punishment appropriately for individuals who repeatedly commit domestic violence crimes. Uh, and why is that important? Again, it's a public safety measure. The first time you commit a domestic violence misdemeanor offense, which is, which is by the way, punching your, significant, punching your partner in the face and causing physical injury is a misdemeanor domestic violence offense. Uh, once you've committed one of those violent offenses, I believe that there becomes a point where you don't get uh, two bites at the apple. Uh, and that when you are shown the second time to have committed another assaultive type offense involving domestic violence, and frankly other types of domestic violence offenses, that the prosecutors ought to be able to enhance that second offense to an e-felony, which would give the judge longer periods of orders of protection to protect the victim, longer periods of probation, the opportunity to use the threat of incarceration as well.